All right, so uh, I don't know when this was. I don't remember how old I was. I was somewhere, I don't know, I, I might have been in the late years of middle school or maybe the early years of high school. And uh, it was one of those things, this happened in my life, and it was one of those things that I did that I think you guys might be able to, um, maybe you can identify with. It was one of those things that was really crazy. When I look back on it, I think, why in the world did I do that? What possessed me to do this thing? Because I look back at it and I see, that was crazy. And that was stupid, really, if you really think about it. It was not smart. Um, so maybe there's some things that you can look back on that. And I, and I also, re I think, man, if I was confronted with that same decision that I had then, I would have never done that. There's no way I wouldn't have done that right, right now where I'm at in my life right now. But this situation was one of those times, you know, I, it was a, it was a hot summer, you know, and my, I went down to my cousins down in Montrose and we decided to go to take our little tubes, right. And to go down this drainage ditch right? And it wasn't just a little ditch. It was big enough for a tube, for two tubes to go down this. Deep in some areas, you know, it's covered with all these, you know, tamarisks and, you know, salt brush and all this stuff. And you know how that is. You, if you've ever been on one of those, there's spiders all over. You know, webs going across the whole thing with these big old spiders that are looking for something to eat. And you're just, you know, going down through this. We had these little paddles that we had built. We were pretty proud of them. You know, we took a nail and board and put it there and we're pushing ourselves around. But we quickly found out that those paddles were really great for whacking those spiders and getting through those webs. So we weren't, you know, just covered in webs. Well, we're going down through there. It was super fun. We were having so much fun. I just remember that was one of the highlights, you know, that I have of being in the, at that age. It was really great. We get to this this time and we start to hear this rushing noise, just water. You know, I mean, it's just going and we're going, oh no, what's going on? So we get through the salt brush and all of that and we're seeing that there's this huge, dark, gaping hole. And it's this massive culvert. It's like 10 to 12 feet high. And we're like, oh my gosh. So we're battling with our little paddles trying to get off to the side, you know, because there's this big open area where the water is just flooding in, rapids and all this stuff. And, and we were just scared to death. So we're trying to get over there. We finally get to the edge of that. And we're looking and we're going, we're talking amongst ourselves. We're going, what are we going to do? Are we going to do this? Are we not? It's a long walk back. And, you know, and, and we had all of these, all this, uh, you, you know, and we were scared, man. We were, we were scared that this was not going to work out. Well, we look down, you know, that tunnel, we get to the edge of it and we look and all the way at the end of that thing, there's just a tiny little sliver of light. And we're looking at that going, wow, there's light at the end. We know there's an end. So we go, okay, let's go. <laughs> we hop into that thing. We don't know what's in there. Could have been a car because we'd passed several of those, you know, that had been dumped into that irrigation ditch. You know, who knows what was in that thing? I mean, that was a, you know, all of those feelings, all of those emotions that are mixed up in that, you know, you're super excited. This is the craziest thing we've ever done. You know, we're talking back and forth, trying to talk each other into it. You know, the fear that's there, the anxiety of not knowing what is there, all of that. And it made that experience just really very, very memorable for us. That's an illustration of what I think, you know, I mean, it's not... I mean, it's a fun illustration of what we've got going on here. But this ninth plague, you know, in the middle of this chapter is, this is towards the end of the plagues, right? And this ninth plague is overwhelming. This is a, these last two, darkness and death, these are the, definitely the most difficult things that Egypt faced. The most devastating in so many ways. So here we are. Let's read through these verses. In verse 21, it says, chapter 10, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness which may even be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. We're going to stop there and look at this. I mean, there's three qualities there. I mean, this is a deep darkness. This is, this is really pretty crazy. And you can see 
right off the bat that, uh, you know, and as Jeff has taught through this, he's, he's kind of told us about the gods, right? That God was really showing his sovereignty over, showing his power over. And this is no different. I mean, the god Ra was one that they worshipped. They believed that the Pharaoh was the friend of Ra, who was the sun god. And they worshipped him. So right now you can see that God can shut your God down, <laughs> right? I mean, that's what, that, that's the, that, that just overarches this whole thing. Darkness. There's three characteristics of this darkness that really um, are amazing. The first one there is in, in, the, in that verse 21, and it says that it may be felt. Have you ever been in darkness that can be felt? I think that that tube that I was in, you could really feel that. I could feel that darkness. You know, maybe you've been in a place where you have really felt that. Uh, have any of you been spelunking anywhere? You know, walking a, you know, through a cave, you go deep down in there. You feel it, don't you? You feel a lot of things when you're down in that darkness. I mean, it's amazing how darkness really has a presence to it. It can really have a presence to it. It doesn't just affect us physically, but it can affect us emotionally as well. I remember I was up in one with my boys. I took my dad and uh, Jesse and Lael. We all went up to the limestone. There's, lime- there's a lot, actually, limestone caves up above um, Glenwood. And there's all kinds of things online that tell you where, how you can get down in there and, you know, do all these things. And one of them was there was this, there was this cave that we were in and there was another, uh, uh, there was a tiny little cave that you could just barely squeeze through, but it opened up into a cavern that had all kinds of crystal in it. And I was like, man, I'm going to that. I'm going to that one. Uh, and, and I ended up doing that, which it was super scary for the boys because I left them. And it was super scary for me too. But you could feel, right? You can feel everything. You can feel the pressure that's coming down. You can feel like the mountain. You're underneath a mountain. I mean, all kinds of thoughts run through your head. I'm going to get stuck. What happens with this? Blah, blah, blah. So we realized that darkness, not only can it be physically felt, But maybe more important for us is understanding that it's emotionally felt. Wow, all that stuff. Your mind just goes crazy. I was camping one time and, man, I I was all by myself. I'm up there laying in the hammock and all of a sudden it gets dark. And in my mind, I think that everything, everything I saw was a bear. I, I, I could define it. I could see it. I knew it. That's what it was. There was never a bear there. You know, but isn't it amazing what the mind can do? And I think that that is. This is a darkness that is felt, and the Egyptians were feeling that. They were feeling that. Who knows what's going through their mind? I, this is just amazing, and it's hard for us. I'm, I'm trying to help us understand, hey, what is going on here? How is this? Because there is, there's, there's so much application for us in this because we end up falling into darkness at times from different kinds of things in our lives. Uh, the, other, the, the second one was a thick darkness. It was really thick. You know, as I was reading through this, there were uh, all kinds of, there's all kinds of ways that we try to explain this, right? I mean, commentators through the, through the years have tried to explain, well, what was the darkness? What, what was it? You know, it's three days long of just darkness. I can't even imagine that. I mean, they say that it was a sandstorm, that it was, you know, the effects of other plagues of, you know, we try to figure it out. The the point of the whole thing is, who knows? I wasn't there. I didn't see it. So I'm not really sure. But it was supernatural for sure. And they knew it. See, that's the thing. This plague, Pharaoh doesn't, you know, it wasn't announced. It just came upon Egypt. And he goes directly to Moses. And he, you know, at the end, we're going to see that. He says, hey, (laughs) you know, we need Moses to get here because, This is not normal. This is God's working. So this was not just, I I think that this was completely and totally supernatural. It was God's hand displaying his great power over something that we take for granted. Light. The other characteristic, the last characteristic that we'll talk about here and that it talks about is that they couldn't move. They weren't moving around. I don't know to what extent that was. They didn't get off their bed. I'm not really sure. But they were paralyzed. And in some ways, you can understand that because who wants to go walk around in a thick darkness that you can feel? You know, who wants? it's scary. Who knows what's going to happen? Who knows where you'll fall? You know, it, it, nobody would be able to help you. You know, so there's some logical reasons why they were right there. They were paralyzed. They were paralyzed by this darkness. 
coming back to that whole idea, I mean, there's a physical presence of this darkness, but also I can't imagine the emotional that was on them. And, and I think that there's a really great application for us in this. You know, darkness is, you know, there, there are things, there, there are ways that it affects us. And spiritually speaking, when we think of the darkness that there, and we're going to look at some verses here in a second, when we, when we, when we look at it, that, that darkness can be really paralyzing. If any of you have ever been in depressed because of your circumstances, if you felt oppression, maybe spiritually or maybe because of, uh, you know, relationships or things that people have said or expectations that people have put on you, there's an oppression that sometimes comes on us and we're like, oh my goodness, we feel that, that, that weight, that darkness of whatever it is. You know, those things can be very, very paralyzing. And the fear that comes from that can be very, very paralyzing. And so in this, we realize that darkness also becomes a real picture of some things. It definitely comes, it becomes a picture of the end, right? And the judgment that God will bring against those who have a hard heart and continue to walk in that hard heart against the ministry and the working of the Holy Spirit to bring them to salvation. And we, that's hell. That's damnation. That is the rejection of the the working of the Spirit of God in the life of a person. And this is how Jesus describes that place, hell. Matthew 8, 12, he says, cast into outer darkness. There will be weeping, gnashing of teeth. 22, 13 says, cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, 30 says, and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Of teeth. I mean, that's how the Bible describes that final death when people have rejected Christ for their whole life and eventually are judged at that great white throne judgment and they are sent away from the Lord, from the presence of the Lord. But also the works of sin and the ways of sin are called the ways of darkness. Look at what this says. Proverbs 2.13, it talks about wisdom It's going to keep us from those who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. See, that sinful path that we can be walking on or that someone can be walking on, the path of sin, it's described as the ways of darkness. Another one, Ephesians 5.11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Talking about the works of sin, really, in the lives of people could be us, could be an unbeliever, whatever, that it's described as darkness. And if I know that we all know this, and we all have been in a place where we have been blinded by sin. Have you ever been in a place like that? I always think of myself and selfishness. You know, it's a hard thing to define, isn't it? Selfishness can be a very difficult thing to define. Am I selfish in the way that I'm doing this? Um, I used to climb, I used to backpack a lot when I was younger. And you know, have you been on one of those trails where you're going up the foothills of something, you're trying to get to a peak, and you come to a place and you're like, oh, well, we're at the summit. And then you go over the top of that and it's like, no, we're not at the summit. We go over that one, and no, we're not at the summit. I thought we were at the summit. You know, sometimes self is, I, I think a lot of times self is like that. We think we're at, we find the end of something, and we find out, no, it was hiding back there behind this thing. And it's like God continues to just kind of peel back, you know, those layers of self. When, I mean, sometimes I'm like, man, what have I got to come to the end of this? You know, self is like that. It can be like darkness that covers over our eyes. We don't actually really see. The, and we need the word of God to discern those things that are in our hearts. Sometimes we're feeling so confused in a situation. It might be because there's sin there. Because we're blinded by our own selfishness. We're blinded by our own way of thinking and not allowing God to peel it back to expose the root that's there. And sometimes that's really painful and it's really difficult for us. But those works of darkness, even in our lives, obviously we see it working in the world around us. There's no doubt about that. We see sin all over the place and rejection of the Lord. But we can't just say them. 
we really need to look at ourselves and we need to allow the Lord to pull that back. That's wisdom. That's what God wants to do. That's what he is continuously doing in those that he loves and are walking with him. So um, the amazing thing about this, and uh, we don't leave just there with this idea of darkness. You know, we have to bring into the idea of this that God is over all this darkness. This darkness that's going on, the Egyptians, they knew it was something supernatural. In the Israelites' homes, they were having light. They were not affected by that deep darkness. I think that's awesome, and we see that reflected in these last plagues, that Israel is protected from the judgments. And as Jeff teaches next week on Passover, we're going to see that they were protected as well through that last horrible plague of death. But we realize that this is the reality. God is light. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. I love that because light is interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's it's really essential for life, for sure, in so many ways. I mean, you can just, if you start thinking about that, it just starts to just pile up. Light is so essential for life. And it's something that we feel, don't we? Just like that darkness that we talked about, light is something that we feel as well. We sense it with our eyes. We can feel it when the sun is shining on your skin, right? You can totally feel the light. And I just love that because God says, here, I I am light. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. He is completely over that. So when we, so here's a great application for that. When we are in a place of darkness and we bring Jesus into that situation, he dispels the darkness. Isn't that amazing about darkness? It goes away when you turn the light on. Aren't you thankful for that? It's just gone. (laughs) Now I can see, I can understand. The fear, isn't that amazing that when you turn a light on, how the fear just goes away? Or it gets less for sure. You know, you're sleeping in bed and you hear the noise and you go turn the light on and there's comfort in it. You feel that comfort. Well, God is that way in the darkest point of our lives. And here, God is wanting to declare that to all. But not only that, but Jesus says this. In John 8, 12, he says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I love that. He is the light of the world. When he comes into the room, when he comes into the place, when he comes into our lives, our circumstance, our situation, he is light. This is from Isaiah, speaking of Jesus, God's servant. It says there in verse 6, I, the Lord, have called you, speaking of Jesus, in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from, uh, from the prison who sit in darkness from the prison house. I love that. That's a beautiful prophecy about the ministry and the work of Jesus, how he was called by God, anointed, ordained (laughs) to minister and to serve mankind by coming in the form of a little tiny baby. When you think of that, I mean, it's just, it's, it's amazing. And it is such a beautiful plan that God has for salvation. But to open the eyes of the blind, and we see that Jesus did it. He did it physically, but he also, and we're testimony of it, opened the eyes, our eyes, spiritually, to see. We were blind, but now we see. And those who will sit in darkness (laughs) from the prison house. I mean, that is just an awesome uh, description of Jesus' ministry. Here's another one in Isaiah 49, 6. It says, Indeed, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Israel and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. That's Jesus that he would be salvation to the ends of the earth. And I'm really so thankful for that. We see that in the Old Testament. His heart was not just aligned with the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was really to be a sign to all the other nations. Really, it was an international sign of God's presence, just like we're dealing with here in Exodus. 
that this was a demonstration of God's power through a people. And God continues to do that through the nation of Israel. I mean, I don't know if you guys have read much of the history of Israel, but wow, just in the recent edge, in the, in the, you should. <laughs> in, recent, in recent history, what God has done in that nation, they don't even know it, right? A uh, large majority of the nation is secular or agno- agnostic at least, but maybe even atheistic, a lot of the nation is. And yet God, I mean, if you read about the Six-Day War and all the things, are it's modern-day miracles. It's amazing what would happen through some of those generals and through some of those people that, that I mean, I read this, or I saw this documentary on, I um, can't remember his name, uh, but he's Netanyahu's uh, brother who was killed in one of those. Uh, actually, yeah, it was in a terrorist uh, kind of situation. But anyway, he was killed in that. But that guy was an amazing general for Israel. He, he, men just followed him into battle. He was an amazing man, kind of like David, <laughs> right? I mean, it's amazing when you start to read about even the modern things of Israel. God has been with that nation and will continue to be with that nation for his glory because they proclaim it, not just nationally, they proclaim it internationally to the world, who God is, that he is God over all things. And they will continue to do it even though they don't know it and that is so amazing so but not only that not only is jesus the light but he says this about us uh, about us or paul says this about us in colossians 1 12 through 13 giving thanks to the father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love aren't you thankful for that that's amazing He's transferred us from darkness into light. And he wants to do that, not just in a, you know, it it wasn't just back then, right, when we accepted the Lord and there was this transformation that happened in us. Yes, it was there. But he wants to continue to do that, to transfer us out of, like we were talking about last week, we hold on to stuff, we won't let go. He wants to transfer us out of that and into the way of his light. In, the, in whatever circumstance that we're in. So it's really awesome that the Lord has not just, he, he's adopted us into that whole process of being a light to the world. Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on the hill cannot be hidden. Nor do, do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I mean, that's that, that's the purpose. There's so much purpose in that. Even in the situation where you feel down, depressed, whatever, that becomes a testimony of God working and moving in our lives. One, one other one that we want to see here is in Ephesians 5.8. For you were once darkness. Wow. We were once darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Should reflect out of who we are. Reflecting the character, the nature. God who is light. Reflected out of who we are. In the things that we say. The things that we do. In whatever capacity we find ourselves in. Because this is God's will. It's his heart for us. We become the will of God walking in this world. Verse 24 of Exodus, if you grab your Bible and turn back there, it says, then Pharaoh called to Moses. So he saw this. um, Overwhelmed by it all. He knows that it's God who has done this. And he says, go serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be kept back. Let your little ones also go with you. But Moses said, you must also give us the sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also shall go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind, for we must take some of them to serve the Lord our God. And even we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. So here we have, you know, um, we have Pharaoh here and he is kind of acquiescing a little bit and saying, hey, you guys can go, you can leave. But we realize it's with conditions and strings and that's his problem there. He can't just totally let go. He wants to keep control. He's got to have some collateral. 
right? Leave your livestock here. Leave your possession. I mean, that's their livelihood. That's what they have to eat. It's like, yeah, you can go out for a little while. How long will they be able to last out there serving the Lord? Well, not very long. You know, they don't have all that for, for millions of people. Yeah, you guys can go. So you see that it's all with strings attached. And that's the problem. In the hardness of heart, oftentimes we'll give lip service to the Lord. Just like Pharaoh is doing here, he's giving lip service to the Lord. But the reality is his heart is hard. He doesn't want to obey the Lord fully. And that is a problem. And it is going to cost him his, you know, his firstborn. It's going to cost him a lot in reality. So, you know, in our lives, you know, we can see that same process happen as, um, as the Lord is calling us into things, as he is, um, you know, giving us that opportunity to partner with him. Sometimes we hold back from it. Sometimes we kind of just have strings attached to the things that God is calling us to. We need to let go fully and, and trust the Lord in that. And trust him in it that he is going to provide all that we need. And I just love what Moses says here. And I think that this is a great, this, this should be the cry of our, our hearts as we look towards stepping out in faith. Because living for the Lord, it's always been this way. God has always desired the godly to live by faith. You can see it all the way through the word of God to live by faith, to trust the Lord. We say it with our mouths and with our lips. But the rubber meets the road, and this is the heart that Moses had. Look at what he says here. He says, we do not know. <laughs> we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. Have you ever been in that place with the Lord where the Lord's called you out and all of a sudden you're like, well, I don't know about that. And common sense kicks in. No, I don't want to do that. There's this, this, and this. I don't know about this. I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I don't understand this. No, I can't do that. I know who I am. There's no way I could do that. You know. And so we justify ourselves out of really just walking by faith. I love this. Here Moses is. He's like, we don't even know. We're going to walk out, but we don't even know how we're going to serve the Lord when we get out there. We got to take everything that we've got See, that's the heart of service. That's the heart of worship to the Lord. I got to take everything that I've got and actually do what God has called me to do. So often I fall short because I'm leaving something behind. I'm letting something, you know, keep, keep me there. I, I have to have my own little piece of collateral. Yeah, I'll give you this, Lord, but not that. No way. You know, that's hardness of our heart, and we need to see it that way. Here, here, Pharaoh's in that place. He's been in that place this whole time, kind of trying to do business with God instead of just submitting and surrendering. I don't want to find myself in that place where I'm trying to do business with God, where my relationship with the Lord just comes to a place of business with Him. should never come to that place where it's duty. It's just religious. It should be that wholehearted, I don't even know what the Lord is going to do. You know, I didn't know what was down that tunnel. When I was, when we were floating down that, I knew there were spiders. My goodness, they were all over the place. You know, but going down that tunnel was really awesome because as I'm going down the tunnel, I'm seeing it's getting bigger. The light's getting bigger and bigger. That's the way it is with the Lord. Because when we step out in faith and we just trust him, he gets bigger and bigger, doesn't he? And I think that we've all experienced that in some way, right? In the circumstances that we're in, all of a sudden the Lord, and we look back on, we say, wow, how did I ever question that first part? How did I ever question that? Why was I trying to attach strings to this? Man, Moses' heart was really great. It was in that place of, no, when we serve the Lord, when we go out of here, we're going into the desert for 40 years. No, you know, he didn't know. He didn't know what was going on. But we look back and we see, oh my gosh, they went out in the desert. They spent 40 years out there walking around. They got to a place where God wanted them to enter Cana. And we know the rest of the story, right? The rest of the story is they didn't have faith to go into that. They, they, they got comfortable for 40 years walking in the desert. And they weren't willing to just let go and finish it out. Wow, that's a, okay, I hear that. <laughs> I'm not trying to be weird here, but that just really hit my heart. To finish it out, here I am, I'm 50 years old. You know, we need to finish strong for the Lord, right? 
We've been, how long have you been walking with the Lord? Is the light at the end of the tunnel bigger for you now than it was, you know, 10 years ago? Or are you just holding on to the beginning and hoping that it all works out? You know, I, I don't know. Sometimes I'm in that place. I, I, I just really feel the conviction of the Lord at that point in my own life. I need to walk out in the Lord, what he has. Oh, man, don't question. Just do what the Lord, because you never know what God is going to require. And the, <laughs> the awesome thing is God provides what we need. I've seen that, right? Here I am fearful, and yet God has provided everything that I needed to get to the point that he said, then I knew I needed to be there. I knew that's where I was going, but how easily I forget all of that. How easily I push it away and I justify myself. I justify my common sense. I justify my own thinking. Let's not do that, man. Let's go. Um, Exodus uh, 10.27 says, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, that process continues in, you know, the Lord just giving Pharaoh over to his desires. You know, just giving him over to what he wants. Doesn't want to give it all up. Doesn't want to give the Israelites up. Doesn't want to see the economy of Egypt crash. However, that whatever he's looking at and basing his decisions on, I'm sure there was a lot of justification there. Then Pharaoh said to him, get away from me. Take heed to yourself and see, and see my face no more. For in the day that you see my face, you shall die. So Moses said, you have spoken well. I will never see your face again. And so, uh, you know, this is really kind of a, a final thing. And it's really good that th th these chapters really are tied together. Because at this point, you're going to see, Moses doesn't actually leave uh, Pharaoh's present, or presence at this point. The Lord continues to talk to Moses here, and he says, the Lord says to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. So this is the announcement of that last plague. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you and out, <laughs> drive you out of here altogether. Speak now in the hearing of the people and let every man ask from his neighbor and every woman from his neighbor articles of silver and articles of gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. So we stop here and we, we think, wow, <laughs> this is amazing. God is going to announce this, and, and, and Moses is talking to the people. He's talking to Pharaoh. And I stop and I think about God giving favor. I wonder, have you experienced that in your life? Have you experienced the favor of God in circumstances? I mean, we see it all the way through Scripture. God's people are favored. They become favored in, in, in all kinds of different ways. We're not just talking money. We're not talking stuff and things, but all kinds of situations, they're favored. Can you, can, you, can you see that in your life? Do you experience that? Do you want that? As you walk in a righteous way, and sometimes even in an unrighteous way, it's amazing how God uses everything. We need to stop here and think about this. God uses it all. He can use it all. I mean, think of, and we have examples of that all along through Scripture we have it. I mean, Abraham, think about Abraham. He made some really bonehead decisions, right? He lied about his, <laughs> lied about his wife, right? No, she's not my wife. She's my sister, which was a half-truth, right? He justified himself in saying, yeah, I'm not telling a little lie, but it was. It was a lie. No, I'm married to her. And he didn't trust the Lord that God could take care of the situation. But he does his little thing. But at the end of that, twice. He's blessed over the top. God asked him to go, <laughs> go back to the Abimelech or whoever it was and says, hey, pray for him. So they see the work of God in a man, even in that silly situation. How about the one that blows my mind is Samson, okay? How could God use a man like Samson? That guy was full of lust in his heart, full of violence. The man was nuts. I mean, really? You, you think that when you read through that. This guy is crazy, the things that he would do. And yet, God used the things that he did in a major way of displaying power over the Philistines. In a major way. See, you don't know how God is going to use that little white lie that you told, maybe. 
You know, we're always concerned about our righteousness and we need to stop and think, why am I concerned about my righteousness? The way that I look in front of people or am I really concerned about the testimony of the Lord? Because a lot of times the things that we do, is it's not really about God. It's about what we look like before people. Be real, be honest, be you. Allow the Lord to work in that. You know, sometimes in the church, we've just made ourselves into this whiteness. We're trying to be just so, you know, righteous that we're afraid to step out of line. And you know what that does? It keeps us from doing anything. Because I don't think I'll have the right words. I don't know that I'll have wisdom for that situation. You know, I don't really know. But when you step out in faith, you never do know. Really. I mean, you can think of the heroes of our faith, you know, even modern heroes and people in their testimony. You see preachers talk about, you know, the things that they've done and they just didn't know where it was going to go. You know what? We need to do that. We need to step out. In your life, you need to be stepping out, trusting the Lord no matter what. It doesn't matter because God can use even the dumb things that you do. Have you ever gone back and, and actually repented before somebody at work? said, you know, that thing that I did, I, I'm really sorry about that. I, I, I don't know what got it. I mean, how many times do you see that in the world? How many times do you see that in your workplace where somebody goes up to somebody and actually apologizes? No, people are pushing. They're pushing guilt on everybody else. Nobody accepts fault. But when somebody does, it's a light. It just shines, shines. We don't need to be worried about those things. We need to trust the Lord and realize it's his righteousness anyway. We can't make it happen. We don't, we, don't, we don't create it. We don't make it happen. The Lord does it as we are just real and honest before mankind. And we allow the Lord to work in each and every situation, even when we blow it. It can be a real testimony of light to people in that situation when you humble yourself. It changes things. So just encourage you to step out. Just serve the Lord. Don't be like Pharaoh here. He's, he's, he's that way. And allow the Lord to give you. That's the kind of favor that God gives us. Not just We're just not looking for favor, for favor. We're looking for the glory of the Lord to be revealed through this mortal flesh that he's blessed us with. That we can actually be an instrument, a partner in his ministry and his work in the world around us. I mean, that is just really amazing that he's called us into that place. So, you know... This happened. I mean, you, you look through those verses and you see the um, in Exodus chapter 12, when they do actually leave, it says there, the commentary on it um, is that they plundered Egypt. <laughs> they walked out with all the, the wealth of Egypt. And you know, that wealth, what did it do? It was seed money. It was the foundation for worship. So those things that you've been blessed with, the things that God has given you favor in, it becomes a foundation for your service and for your, your worship that you would give to the Lord. However he calls you, however he's moving in your life, just like here, that was the foundation of the tabernacle, all that gold. You know, they put it on the, they made this beautiful thing that glorified the Lord and it was obedience to his plan, his purpose. And it became a place where, wow, the glory of the Lord dwelled there. The light of God was there. Can you imagine that? Coming out of the Holy of Holies. His presence, physical, that you could see. I mean, wow, that is just really amazing to think about. And that was that. But, you know, the Lord wants us to, to have his glory shining out of us as well. We can apply that to our life. He can do that. It won't look the same. It may not be the same circumstance or situation, but God is, is wanting to do that in each of our lives. Verse four says, then Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the animals. Then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor shall be like it again. Wow, that is, I mean, talk about devastation. This is definitely the worst of all of them. You know, as far as lingering and how far this reaches, I mean, this is lifetime. This reaches a lifetime that you lose your firstborn. You know, I can't, I, 
I can't imagine losing even any one of my children and how long that would stay with me and the memories and the things like that. This plague is horrible. I mean, this is just horrible. You know, you think that if this is announced that Pharaoh would fall on his knees and just say, no, we don't want that here in Egypt. I mean, look, raise your hand. Are you a firstborn? I am. I am a firstborn. I mean, look at all the hands that are raised here. You guys wouldn't be here. You'd be dead. You'd be gone. A lot of people in Egypt. And so God predicts that this is going to be the case there. Um, I'm not going to really go into this a whole lot because I don't want to take away from what Jeff is going to say next week because he's going to spend the whole chapter talking about Passover and how the nation of Israel was saved from that and, and all that God called them to. And so I want to leave that there. But what I do want to say is these plagues, and I kind of alluded to this last time, every one of these plagues, they, 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 they characterize sin in some way. Like I kind of was joking about the frogs, you know, that the frogs, sin is kind of slippery. It's kind of slimy. It's hard to find it, right? Sometimes we're in the middle of it and we don't even really know what it is. We need discernment to know what sin is. I mean, the, the plague of boils, it's like sin. I mean, popping and gushing and all over that nastiness. If you've ever had something like that, I mean, it's gross. Some of those boils are even contagious. They get on somebody else and they just spread. That's the way sin is. If you think about hail, hail is heavy. It does damage. That's the way sin is. It's like that. Locusts, think about that. They consumed everything. They're consumers of everything. That's the way sin is. If you've got wrapped around a sin in your mind, it consumes everything. It comes up when you don't really want it to. It's just there. I mean, sin is destructive. It's destructive. Every single one of the plagues, the plagues point to some characteristic of sin. And this last one is the worst of all because it points to the end of sin, which is what? Death. Death. Eternal separation from God in darkness. And that is the bottom line of sin. That's what sin is all about. And that's what Romans 6, 20 3 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm just really glad that that verse is there because it tells me that what sin is, which I need to know that, I need to know what it leads to, but then it also gives me hope. And that's why that verse is so awesome because it gives me hope that that's not the end. And that is the reality that we're facing here in this. You know, the end is not death. But when we repent, and that's God's heart, is that we will repent from sin and that he will turn that around and that we will be able to walk in his life. You know, um, another really great verse that talks about that. I deleted it out of my PowerPoint. And I don't know why I did that. James 1, um, <clears throat> one fifteen talks about desire giving rise to what? Sin. And then sin conceiving and giving birth to death. That's the cycle. That's what sin does, period. We can't mock God. That's what Galatians 6 says. Nobody's going to be mocked. Whatever a man sows, he's going to reap. If you sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. If you sow to life, you reap everlasting life. I mean, that's the bottom line. We have choices to make in our lives. Even us as believers, we can get trapped in that. Realize, and, and we just need to realize that God is light, that he, he, that he is hope, and that he has so much for us as we walk in faith with him. And um, that he does this. But against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue against man or beast, that you may know that the Lord does make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out! And all the people who follow you after that, I will go out. Then he went out from Pharaoh in great anger. So we see, finally, Moses leaves. He announces this final plague, this horrible plague, and then he leaves. He's in anger. He's overwhelmed probably by the situation, realizes that Pharaoh is not going to repent. Not going to soften his heart. He's just, you know, I don't know, caught up in the... the I, I, I don't know if you've ever been witnessing to somebody or just being a testimony in somebody's life. And you can just see the decisions that they're making over and over again. You get to that point where you're just frustrated, don't you? It's like, wow, they just really don't see that. The hardness of the heart. It's something that is 
a character of human nature, the hardness of heart. And it is, it's, it's maddening when we come against that. And I think that Moses was driven into that point after all of this that he'd been through, all the destruction, all of the words that have been said. And, and you know, it says that Moses was the meekest man. And I have to believe that he really was hoping that, that Pharaoh would repent. I mean, that's the heart of God. God doesn't really want you know, men to be thrown or women to be thrown into the lake of fire or be judged. He wants that. I, that's the way I look at repentance or that's the way I look at judgment. It's God's kind of calling card. Get your life straightened out because this is what I've said. This is what happens. If you, if, you, if you continue on in this, this is what happens. And the plagues in a major way really show us that. And so we're going to close the chapter out here. But the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not heed you so that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. So Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the children of Israel go out of his land. Pharaoh hardened his heart. He kept on in that way. I talked about Romans chapter 1 and just the down slide or the slide, the devolution of man, how when the will is just enacted against the Lord and his goodness, that God gives us over to the different things that are there. I mean, that's, that's what God has said in his word, and we see that happening over and over again. Pharaoh hardened his heart, and in the end here, God is making that decision completely and totally firm, and he's hardening Pharaoh's heart. Uh, it's a hard thing for me to swallow at times, and yet we go back to what we really know. God is sovereign over all things. He's sovereign nationally. He's sovereign internationally. He's sovereign individually. He's sovereign in every circumstance of our life. And as we trust him in all those areas, he moves and he works in that. But if we harden ourselves against it, there will be consequences. You can't mock God. What he says will happen. It will happen. And he, his, his word is true. Mm-hmm.